All right, welcome back to the program. My guest is joining me right now from Lagos, the capital uh, or the commercial city, capital, commercial capital city, supposedly, yeah, of Nigeria. Mustafa Chikobi, the chairman, Fidelity Bank PLC, and the president at Bank, uh, the Bank Directors Association of Nigeria, newly elected president. Mr. Chikobi, good to see you quite a while. Congratulations are in order. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. So nice to have you on the program again. Let's get uh, started. I'll come to the issue of BDAN in a bit, but uh, the Nigerian economy surprisingly grew 5.01%. According to the NBS, that was a, a, a very startling data for every one of us that watch issues of the economy. What are your uh, you know, thoughts on this? Well, it was a very welcome development. I was very pleased to see it. Uh, it's something that we all hope for, that the economy will take a positive trajectory. Uh, it's a start. It's not the end, but it's a very good start. And I congratulate everybody involved in achieving this wonderful recovery in our economy. Do you think that uh, the pandemic policy responses that we saw at least in 2020 help us get to where we are right now from the fiscal side as well as the, pol uh, the monetary policy side? I think that I will commend the monetary side, um, that is the CBN, a lot more than I'll commend the fiscal side because the fiscal side has been intent on revenue drives in the form of levies and taxes. And I think that that will have provided somewhat of a drag on the economy. But I think that the monetary side, as CBN with the stimulus, with its forbearances, I think CBN did a really, really good job in the last, throughout the uh, pandemic. I would urge the fiscal side to take a very good look at all these levies and fees from all the agencies of government that acts as a kind of a tax increase and is providing a drive to the economy. Now, if you take a look at this 5.01% growth, uh, which we've seen so far, quite surprising for an economy uh, that grew 0.51% in the first half of uh, this year, what sectors do you think that we should intensify uh, our efforts in to be able to pull us out of, uh, of, of, of the pit? But definitely, we're out of the pit with this 5%, but to give us a robust recovery, perhaps in the, in the third quarter, which we are in right now. Well, I think we should focus on labor-intensive industries because unemployment is a big problem in Nigeria. I think it's creating a lot of the crime, the restlessness, and all the, uh, you know, talks about various groups breaking up. I think unemployment is a very big problem in Nigeria that has not been addressed. So I would focus my efforts on labor-intensive industries as opposed to capital-intensive industries. Um, the industry that everybody is talking about now with a lot of expectation and glee is the ref refinery industry. I am fairly skeptical because refineries are heavily capital intensive. They don't employ many people. And I think that will end up being a drag on our capital, our scarce capital, without creating many jobs. I would focus on building. I would focus on infrastructure. I would focus on agriculture and agro industries, things that employ a lot of people. Because employment, I think, is the second biggest problem in Nigeria today. Do you think that this growth of 5.01% is really sustainable? And I'm asking that question, uh, that if we say, let's go on the trajectory of this 5%, let's not get back to where we were before, minus 6%, minus 3%, 0.51%. But can we sustain this 5% growth, even if we're not going to go into a double-digit growth? At least, can we sustain that 5% growth for the remaining part of this year? The quick answer is, I am very, very doubtful that we can. I think that um, we are coming from a low base. And when, you, when the base increases, it's tough to continue to grow at 5%. We will not grow at 5% in the next quarter or the next unless serious changes are made 
to the economic policy of Nigeria. So while this is a welcome development, I expect that this growth will moderate in the third quarter and moderate even further in the fourth quarter of this year. Mm. We, need, we need not be too happy with this number to the extent that we're not formulating forward-looking policy, but I don't see much of that happening right now. Mm. Where do you think that there are cracks right now, especially around the management of the Nigerian economy? Where do you think that we have cracks that we really need to fix? Okay, let me, let me pick one. I have complimented the Monetary Authority, CBN. Well, let me say that I believe that the CRR for banks is way too high and is constraining the bank's ability to lend money uh, or make appropriate income that they should be making. So I think that the CRR is too high. At 27.5%, the CRR, which is the cash reserve requirement for banks, is reducing the amount banks can lend. And I think that that is starving the, the economy of credit. I will encourage the CBN to take another good look at the CRR. I know they're doing it to protect the value of the Naira. But there are other ways to protect the value of the Naira without starving the economy of credit. That's the first place I would look. The second place I would look is, again, subsidies. We have too many subsidies in Nigeria. The electricity subsidy is a huge problem for, for power companies. And we are treating electricity as if it's a social good that everybody has a right to. Unfortunately, electricity is a capital good that only those who can afford it should pay what the market can bear. And that's the way we deal with the telecom industry. And that's what reduced the price of telecoms uh, down the road. If we keep trying to subsidize electricity, we will never have enough of it. And that's a huge drag on the economy. Uh, the foreign exchange subsidy still exists. The official rate is 100 naira lower than the parallel market rate. And I, also, I believe also very strongly that that rate must be narrowed. However that is done will be beneficial to the economy going forward. Let's talk about inflation and let's just oppose it with the GDP numbers which we just got right now. I also know, at least for those that studied economics too, perhaps if you also have higher GDP growth or higher economic growth, it tends to also cause uh, inflation, but that doesn't seem to be the case here in Nigeria. We have inflation rate at the upper tens. Uh, we just got a 5.01% economic growth rate. So how do you just oppose it? High inflation is not running away now, is moderating. But how do you just, just oppose it with a 5% growth which we have seen? How can there be, you know, that kind of rebalancing? Well, the 5% is the real GDP growth. The nominal GDP growth was probably more like 22%. So the number, the 5% is the number adjusted for inflation. So it's a real number. Um, so if you look at nominal, the, the nominal GDP grew by probably over 20%. So um, you can have high, high inflation and you can have higher nominal growth, and when you subtract the two, you get, you get the result of the GDP, of the real GDP. So that 5% is the real number, and that is why I commend it. Um, it's, of course, better for inflation to be lower, uh, but the cost, I would take higher inflation if I can get higher employment. My problem with our economic policies is that we have fairly high inflation, even though it moderated last month, and we have fairly high unemployment. Those two things tell me that there's a huge gap in the thinking of the policymakers. With that level of inflation, we should have very low, very, very low unemployment, and we're not having it. So we need to take a good look at that. If I, if my employment was at 5%, 6%, even 10%, I can live with inflation, but I cannot live with inflation this high and unemployment this high, and no country can. Mm. That's why, that's why our misery index is high. You see an, an unemployment rate of 33%. South Africa happens to be uh, the highest in Africa, and Nigeria is number two. So we have an unemployment rate of 33%, uh, an inflation rate of 17%. Uh, There's a poverty rate also by the side. So misery index, many people in Nigeria are miserable, if not all of us.
<laughs> you know. But let's move over to your recent uh, position. Current, how many days old? President of Bank Directors Association of Nigeria. Uh, you have taken up the mantle, I think, from Osaiti Demore, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what color are you going to be bringing to this association that many Nigerians do not even know if they exist, if, if the association uh, does exist? <laughs> Well, let me say that there are three very, very important industries in Nigeria. Um, I would say telecoms, I would say the oil industry, and I would say the banking industry. Um, apologies to any other industry that I've, I've omitted, but I think these three industries are very important to the Nigerian economic growth. Um, I think that banks have not been represented as robustly as an industry, as they should. I think the banking system, in, the financial system in every country in the world is probably the lifeblood of the economy. Uh, so one of the things I want to, I hope to do is to A, raise the profile of the banking industry in a positive way. Work with the regulators and the legislators to make sure we're working to the same objective and you know, to the public, our customers, our most important constituency. Well, maybe the depositors are, but customers are pretty close to our most important constituency. I want them to understand that a bank is a partner, not a predator, not a place where you go and they charge you all sorts of fees, hidden fees and all that. One, we partners with our customers. And so if those are the images I want to project. I will tell you that BDAN has not been sufficiently funded in the past. Um, I think that needs to be reviewed. BDAN was created in, effectively in 2001 um, out of a 1997 conference. It became, became operational in 2001. And the contribution to BDAN by the banks since that time, I don't believe has changed much in all that time. And I think that BDAN needs to be a better advocate for the banking industry to the benefit of all. So that's my long-term objective for BDAM. I want every Nigerian to know what BDAM means by the end of my tenure. I think it's an ambitious objective, but I hope that at least I can start the really risk going. So whoever comes after me certainly has an easier job with it. What, what do you think? Who do you think are the largest shareholders, are the largest stakeholders, let me use that language, are the largest stakeholders of banks in Nigeria? And I know why I'm asking this question, because I've heard the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin A. Mifeli, say at different fora that it's the bank customers that really own the banks, in terms of the bank depositors, and not the shareholders, so to speak, and perhaps not the bank directors that are being appointed. What's, what's your view to that? Well, for, for the, from my point of view, as you know, I, I, I was at Amcon. The most important constituency to me for a bank is the depositors. And the depositors' interest must be very carefully guarded. And there are two institutions that watch the interest of the depositors, the NDIC and the CBM. So yes, depositors are the most important constituency. When we were doing AMPAN, the people that we protected the most and who didn't lose a cover in the whole of the financial mess of the 2009 era were the depositors. The depositors were made whole. Next to the depositors, I believe, are customers in general. Of course, customers include depositors and borrowers. Um, the good borrowers were taken care of. The defaulting borrowers, obviously, that was what Amcon was set up to deal with the defaulting borrowers. Next to that is the bank employees. The bank employees were also largely protected and should be protected as much as possible. So that leaves management and then that leaves shareholders. I think shareholders should be the least, the last group that are protected. And again, during the Amcon process, the shareholders were the ones that were mostly uh, wiped out by the actions of Amcon and CBN. So yes, I think the, the, the governor is right. Depositors are the most important constituency. And I think that this, the Nigerian financial system 
has protected the depositors as well as any system in the world. Let's talk about the borrowing behavior because you were the pioneer uh, managing director of the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, AMCON, what we call the bad bank, you know, the bad, <laughs> collecting bad loans. You know, you serve the eternal there, you've left. We have Ahmed Kuru there. Do you think, in retrospect now, that the borrowing behavior, especially from bank directors, you know, from bank insiders, uh, has changed? Or has it changed from uh, worse to bad? Or do we now have it from worse to worst? Especially putting in mind what just happened, uh, you know, at the First Bank of Nigeria just a few months ago, where we even saw the Central Bank of Nigeria come so hard on, on the board of First Bank of Nigeria. So the borrowing behavior of uh, the bank insiders, inside, insider dealings, what would you say about that? That perhaps other depositors, if they I go would, for loans, will not even have opportunities, but those within the space get monies for their businesses. Okay, I will say to you that the insider-related loans are very closely monitored by the CBN. I also believe that with the new BOFIA Act, insider-related loans, and they are broadly defined. If you are director of a company and you are associated with any other company, any loan that company takes is considered an insider-related loan. Um, so it's broadly defined. It's, it's watched very carefully. There are limits to it. The limits are quite stringent, and CBN enforces those limits uh, when they send examiners. Um, we just had an examination, and they took a very, very close look at insider-related loans. So I think that is under control. I personally have pledged to Fidelity Bank that as long as I'm chairman, I will not be part of any insider loan related to me, either personally or any company that I'm associated with. Um, that's the standard I set for myself because I know what happened at Amcon. But I can assure the, the Nigerian community that insider related loans are a very, very red flag for the CBN and its examiners and is completely under control as far as I know. I would like it less than it is now, but I think that banks are sticking to the limits, and the limits are quite strict. What, what do you think about bad loans right now, especially the portfolio of bad loans? You know, Amcon, as the pioneer MD, Amcon was given a lifespan of, I think, 10 years. Now it's over 10 years. Do you think we can really recover from the carnage that was done in 2009? Because the NP, bad loans are still huge, and I guess that Amcon is also struggling right now in terms of even getting those monies back though there's a 10 percent levy that is paid by banks amcon levy or so that's what it's called you put that you were the one that set it up so yeah if if um you know those banks are paying that levy do you think that we can really recover uh, from the issue of bad loans uh, in nigeria and what should be the lifespan of amcon is it an organization that will just continue like that I'm so happy you asked that question, Nancy. So just give me a few minutes to explain, to expand on your question. Firstly, Ampon has had no and has no legal lifespan. Mm. Uh, the 10 year that people refer to was the plan CBN and Ampon put together for the time it should take us to acquire the bad loans, recover the bad loans, and pay off Ampon's liabilities. It was a planning a disciplined planning time frame, not a legal one. Um, when one of the key assumptions in that 10-year plan, initial 10-year plan, was that the bank asset will grow by a certain percentage. I think we used 15% growth because the history of bank assets had been over 20% prior to Amcon. So we assume 15% growth rate. It turns out that because of the restrictive monetary policies that the CBN embarked on after Amcon, the growth rate was much less than 15%. And that by extended our planning by about three years. So we did another plan. We raised the levy from 30 basis points to 50 basis points, the Amcon levy, um, 50 basis points of total assets. And we extended Amcon's planning to 2023. 
it's now clear that 2023 will not happen because AMCON still has significant uh, liabilities that will not be extinguished by the bank levy by 2023. And one of the things I want to encourage AMCON and CBN to do is to create another plan that tells everybody when AMCON levy for the banks will cease. It has become a very, very big expense item for banks. And it's not fair for AMCON levy to be an open-ended expense for banks. So we will sit down, hopefully, with AMCON and CBN and work out a new plan, even if it's 10 years more. I think banks can live with 10, year, 10 years more, as long as there's a definite end to the levy. The open-ended levy, I believe, is not advisable. And I don't think it is fair to the bank shareholders to have an open-ended growing liability without an end in sight. So um, we did start the levy. We did plan for 10 years. The plans didn't work. We extended it to 13 years. 13 years will not work. Um, but I think that there could be a plan that is definitive as to when the Ampon levy will end. And I, so, and I hope CBN and Ampon will work on it and BDAN is willing to support that effort. Um, I hope that BDAN could also look into the perception of banks uh, among, at least within Nigeria. And why I'm asking this specifically is that there's this perception that banks are not helpers of the economy. They are profit takers. Of course, it's a capitalist environment. In the years of treasury bills, that you can just go buy some treasury bills, you make money, I'm chair banking, just like the chair I'm seated on here right now. How do you think that banks in Nigeria will be seen so far as helpers of the economy, not those or not practitioners that milk the economy? A, a young business owner will want to walk into like Fidelity Bank, which you're the chair, or any other bank in Nigeria, I need loan to start a business. And that person will not be listened to. But if the likes of the big men and the big women go into that place, they assist them, perhaps without even collateral or so. So that perception is there. How do you think that can be, you, you know, resolved? It's a two-step process. Firstly, let me admit that banks have had a bad uh, image over the years. And let me also admit that some of that image is deserved. So the first step of the process is for us all in the banking industry today to look internally and make sure that we're positioned and we're motivated to serve the customers big and large. That's the first step, an internal review process by the banking industry of how it conducts itself and how it presents itself to, the, to the, its community, again, its customers largely. We are going to do that. We are doing that at Fidelity, and I think that every bank is going through the process of reviewing its policies and its attitude to its customers. Um, I think that things have improved dramatically, but I think there's some way to go. The other side is the customers. A bankable project requires a lot of work. People just think they can walk into a bank with a good idea, and the bank should give them money. Some of them don't even understand the language of a balance sheet, income statements, projected financial statements. And, it, and we think these people are important. So one of the things we want to do, um, I don't want to promote Fidelity too much. No, don't this, promote. Except you will uh, pay. Fidelity interview. will pay. But one of the things Fidelity is looking at is to have a department that helps small businesses, medium-term businesses actually present their projects in a way that's bankable. Because many of them come in, they don't have audited statements. One of the things that is amazing is people start a business and it's profitable. But they don't show the profits. They take out all the profits because that's the, that's the style. They don't realize that down the road, when they want to borrow from a bank, we look at the three years, five years profit. And if you're not profitable over five years on your books, but you're profitable that you're taking out your profits personally. What happens is we don't lend to you because we don't see any profits. 
So we are trying to have seminars, portals, education modules that tell small businesses how to present their businesses, how to keep their books, so that in future they are more bankable. So it's, it's on both sides. Banks have improvements to make, but a lot of the smaller customers have improvements to make. The big customers, the Dangotes, the, the Glows, the MTNs, they keep very good books. They know how to present their projects. That's why they get an easier time of it. It's not because we are biased towards them. It's just that they speak our language and we understand them and they understand us. We need to speak the same language with the small businesses as well. Mm. If we take a look at the year 2020 and how banks or the profits that banks returned, um, talking about their profit after tax, also the dividends. A lot of banks in Nigeria was actually surprised that even when we were on a lockdown, the whole world was on a lockdown. Banks in Nigeria, at least they tried in terms of, they made so much money. Let me not say they tried because some shareholders are also going to cream out slices of those dividends, uh, slices of those profits as dividends. Why do you think this was so? I think we learned a lot. Uh, I think that one of the biggest problems with banks is the cost income ratio. Um, on, that, uh, on that venue, GT has the lowest cost income ratio. Um, and so they keep the expenses down and that's why their profits are always so high because their costs are low. I think that during the pandemic, a lot of banks, us included, learned that there are some expenses that we don't really need. Um, we don't really need huge banking halls. Um, I think, and I know CBN wouldn't like this, but I think that we have too many branches in an era of internet banking, in an era of uh, mobile banking. I think that the branch network system is extremely expensive and CBN should look at allowing banks as a whole to reduce their branches. If we can reduce our costs, we'll reduce what we charge in interest, we'll all, we'll all be better off because we do pass on some of these costs to our customers. So we learned how to save money during the pandemic. And any increase in income you're seeing, if you look carefully, is actually largely from cost savings, not from income increases. Mm. Um, so I think that if we can combine income increases with cost savings, you will find a much more robust banking system in the next in the years coming. We're seeing but we learned a lot from the pandemic. Okay. We're, we're seeing that some banks are going with this holding company models. Now, I don't want to mention names. We just saw one of the banks in Nigeria uh, do, do, do that. What, what do you think about this strategy uh, moving forward? That's the A part of the question. The B part of the question is a follow-up from what you've said in terms of the amount of monies that banks made in 2020 was as a result of savings, cut savings. Would you also say that because of what the pandemic has done, we've seen innovation, perhaps from fintech companies and giving banks a run? Because during, at least last year, a lot of young people, entrepreneurial spirit, came up with different innovations, different solutions, financial solutions, I must say. So do you think that the fintech companies are giving the banks a run for their money? Two questions. Well, again, I, I, and I, I, I say this all the time, financial technology is very, very important. Um, as you know, when Polaroid, the camera, the instant camera came into being, it was highly celebrated as the next best thing. And now, because of the cell phone and the cell phone cameras and digital photography, Polaroid is no more. Um, yes, well, we celebrate those things, but we have to look at the fun fundamentals. Can a fintech company lend to a dangote? I don't think so. Can a fintech company lend to Boa Cement? I don't think so. Um, Do you see them lending in the future? Make banking more efficient and cheaper. Absolutely. We are a fintech company. Yes, because use financial you use financial technology. technology. Do you see the fintech companies lending technology. to those companies in the future? Because I, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
I was actually asking okay. from your question, you, uh, from your answer, you did say that you don't see fintech companies lending to huge conglomerates. But in the future, do you see them doing that? Because these are companies now that are getting interest from abroad, getting interest from huge capitalists, people that have so much money in their hands with ego ego dollars, not Naira. <laughs> so do you see people or fintech companies doing that in the future? No, they don't have they don't have the funds to lend to a Bangladesh cement. They just don't have it. They have the technology to make lending easier, payments easier. They have the technology to make lending to remote areas possible at a reasonable price. But I think that 10 years from now, we, certainly Fidelity Bank, will be adopting all those technologies as well. It's not limited to fintech companies. So right now, they are doing things that we didn't think were profitable to do. And they found a way to make those things profitable. But we don't see them as competition for our core businesses. We see them as, put it this way, intellectual basis for making our business more efficient. And we'll be foolish not to adopt those uh, financial technologies that make business more efficient. But as to them chasing deposits like we do, having a huge deposit base and being able to lend $100 million to a number of big companies, I don't see that happening in the near future. And if that's their business model, I suspect that they run into trouble. Okay, the holding company model, which I asked earlier. Yes. The holding company model, if you notice, most of the holding companies are the larger banks. I mean, GT has made a big noise of, of, of going into the holding company structure. I believe First Bank is on the holding company structure. I think there are benefits and there are negatives to that structure. Um, we are looking at it and um, we will make a decision at the right time whether we want to go into that uh, um, structure. But I think it is largely cosmetic. It has some benefits. And what we want to focus on at Fidelity is how to make our bank more profitable and more solid and more sustainable for the future. But we'll look at it. It's something that we are considering and looking at, but we haven't reached any decisions about it yet. OK. I'm not asking you specifically for the bank which you are the chairman. So we are not talking about your bank now. We are talking about the general banking industry. So I would appreciate that we stay on that line. <laughs> now let's talk about the interest rates in banks because the NPR at 11.5%, the last MPC meeting still left it at that. Many Nigerians still, you know, uh, voice out that interest rate of banks are too much. I can't do businesses with, with those kind of, you know, high interest rate, 30%, 35%, or even more. Well, you have to understand that the um, NPR, the, the monetary policy rate, is a function of balancing the exchange rate considerations with the credit to the economy uh, considerations and with inflationary expectations. I personally, as I said earlier, would prefer a much lower NPR and let the inflation rate and the exchange rate find its acceptable market value. That's my position. I'm a growth person. But I understand the policymakers have to deal with those three things. And when you grapple with those three things, you end up trying to reduce inflation, trying to keep the foreign exchange stable, and that leads you to higher interest rates. Um, it's unfortunate. I agree with you that interest rates are too high for many businesses. And so many businesses are starved of credit. But it's a balancing act, and um, until you, you are in a seat where you can see all the pieces, it's difficult to be too critical of the decisions of the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee. So they're balancing a lot of important things, and I think while I prefer lower rates, I understand that they, are, they have other pressures that they're dealing with. Do you think that Nigerian banks are sound and safe and healthy? Uh, the Nigeria Development Update, which was launched by the World Bank in June of this year, there was a chapter that talked about the financial sector, that Nigerian banking industry is showing 
signs of stress, perhaps because of the uh, expected rise of the NPLs, as well as the uh, regulatory forbearance. You also mentioned that earlier while you were speaking. How safe, uh, no, how sound, not safe now, how sound are Nigerian banks? And do you think that there is a need for a ca capitalization moving forward? Because I know there was a time that the CBN was mulling that idea too. I believe that the banking industry today is as sound as it has ever been. I don't see, I mean, an event can happen, obviously, that can change our perception. We can have another COVID or some other dramatic event. But absence an event like that, Nigerian banking system is as sound as it has ever been. And no, I do not foresee another uh, AMCOM or another disaster in the banking industry. It's not something that's on the radar, but again, events can happen, but right now we are as sound as we've ever been, in, uh, as to my knowledge. For the EFCC has said that from September 1, that banks will definitely be held, you know, liable, is placing banks under surveillance, a staff and institutional uh, management involvement in crimes. Uh, we saw the EFCC chair, Abdul Rashid Bawa, I think mentioned that a few a few days ago because it's been said that banks are also part of the trouble that we are having around financial uh, crimes. What, what's your view to this, especially as you're the president of BDAN? I agree with um, the EFCC chairman. I agree that we should look forward. I agree that banks have a role to play in minimizing economic crimes. Um, and I believe that's part of the internal examination I mentioned, that we should all look at ourselves and make sure we are aligned with the interest of the country. Um, having said I agree with his statement, I'm not endorsing the fact that banks have in the past been guilty of massive amounts of infractions. I think that there have been infractions here and there, like in every other industry, but I think that it's good for the EFC chairman to make a clear statement, and I think it's important for the banks to listen. What do you think about the other part of what he said, that he has he's told the banks to uh, probe the sources of income of their customers? So uh, most, at least, uh, more than 40% of Nigerians have bank accounts. So the banks should now begin to probe the income sources. I walk into a bank or my account officer should be asking me now, say, how did you get this money? How did you get this money? That is what the EFCC is saying. Do you think that that is actually achievable and feasible? Well, he's not the only one saying that. CBN also tells us that we should look, there's some who call KPR. We should know our customers. Yes, know your customers. Uh, is, is it KPR? No, it's not. It's uh, K... KYC. Uh, it's something with a K. It's, it's, KYC. It's know your customer. KYC. No, no. The CBN has said that for a long time. We should know where our customers mm -hmm. are getting the money from. We should know their sources of, uh, of income. We should be very, very knowledgeable about our customers. And um, he's just reiterating what is a core part of banking, that we should know our customers. We should know what they do. We should know how they make their money. And um, so what he's saying is just emphasizing what we already know and what the regulator has already told us. Mm. I, are the banks doing it's called that? It's KYC. Yes, KYC. KYC, know your customer. Yes, KYC. And let, let, me, let me go back to the thing you said about the industry as a whole and not as not fidelity in particular. Um, I was referring to the fact, I was trying to say in a certain way that the bigger banks who have basically dominated the landscape are the ones that have the luxury of looking at all these, um, how will I say, complex structures yes and that the tier two and tier three banks i would advise to focus on the business at hand and dominate and get to dominate those those businesses uh that's what i was referring to that's why i use fidelity as an example <laughs> yes but i agree with you that um we should talk about industry as a whole yes so that fidelity if fidelity wants to promote itself it should pay but let's move over to 
the issue we're still handling a pandemic COVID-19 pandemic is not over how big of a threat do you think that this COVID-19 Delta variant is uh, to the banking industry as well as uh, you know the larger economy because I know that overseas some banks I think JP Morgan Chase or so or is it Goldman Sachs or so as the, their staff came back to work but now they've told them okay you can do three times from home and all of that. Do you think it's so much of a threat in Nigeria to the Nigeria's banking industry as well as the economy? I think that everybody should take COVID very seriously. I think that we've seen from American experience that it's not over. Um, and we should all take it very seriously. But I think that we have learned a lot better how to live with COVID. Um, so I don't think the impact on the economy will be as devastating as it was in 2020. Um, will it have an impact? Probably. Will it be as serious as it was so that we shut down everything and the economy goes into deep, a deep hole? No, I don't think so. I think we should all be careful. We should wear masks. We should do all the things they tell us to do. We should vaccinate as quickly as possible. But I also think there's opportunities for countries like Nigeria because um, it hasn't hit us that hard in terms of deaths and serious illness. And so the things that we can do well, is our supply chains, um, I think that we can start doing more local manufacturing um, and learning to be more self-sufficient. So we should look at those things, but it will not be as dramatic as it was in 2020. As we wind down, what do you think are risk of the unknown that we should take cognizance of, unknown risk, you know? Are there like risks that are unknown that we should take cognizance of? Perhaps the larger economy or even your industry? I, I said yesterday that I think that Nigeria's number one problem is the economy. People are losing hope in our economy. Our young people are leaving to Canada. Our young people are leaving to the UK. A lot of people are living to the U.S. I think that we should focus on things that give people economic hope, a hope for a brighter, more prosperous future. I think as long, and again, a lot in the economy, perception matters quite a bit. Mm. Um, so I don't think we're doing a good enough job as a country looking at how to give our young people hope, looking at of how to make our young people believe that there's a brighter future thinking that our young people can, can live better than we did. I think many Nigerian young people feel that we can, they can never live as well as us old folks. And I think that's a disaster. So while we're getting some good news from the economy in the last week or so, we need to not pat ourselves on the back and look forward to how we can create hope for our young people. I think that's our biggest problem. And I think that if that is properly addressed, I think that we can get ourselves out of this bad economic situation we're in. In one minute, um, I like that aspect that you brought in, but about the risk of uh, insecurity. Uh, you also did say concerning the economy is more of perception, you know, than even reality. Um, when the attack at the NDA happened, I know how many calls I got in terms of, oh, Nancy, is Nigeria still a safe place to do business? So how much of a risk do you think that this insecurity is posing to Nigeria's economy? I think insecurity is a result of a bad economy. I, and I, again, I said there's no country in the world with a robust economy where they have insecurity of any magnitude. So I, I think that when we keep talking about insecurity, no matter how we talk about it, if people have no jobs and people don't have an economic hope, there will be insecurity. So let's address the root cause of insecurity. Yes, insecurity is, 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 is like somebody saying somebody is sick and can't go to work and earn money. Of course, that is true. But the way you address that is to get the person well. You don't say, uh, because the person is sick, there's no money, so that's the end of the matter. The root cause of insecurity, the root cause of agitations, the root cause of brain drain is the fact that we have a weak economy. Let's get our economy going again. And I assure you and all Nigerians, insecurity will vanish like magic. If we have an economy going at double digits, people working, people earning money, 
I think that you'll find much of this insecurity will disappear. Thank you very much, Mr. Chikiobi, for joining me on today's edition of the program and for your perspectives. It's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Nancy. All right, I've been speaking with Mustafa Chikobi, who is the chairman of Fidelity Bank PLC, as well as the president of the Bank Directors Association of Nigeria. Thank you all for your company at today. Please join us again next Monday, God willing, on this channel. I will be here. I am Nancy Naji. Be the best you can be and be the change you want to see by now. <laughs>